Well, thank you so much for joining us today. This is the second webinar in our Patient-Centered Value Assessment and Alternatives to the Quali four-part webinar series. This one is Alternatives to the Quali, Generalized Risk-Adjusted Quali, or the Gray Quali. Um, and we're very excited to have Dr. Darius Lakdawalla with us. So I know there are some non-members on the line, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about who the NHC is. Um, we're made up of more than 180 national organizations and businesses. Our core membership really includes um, health-related associations, nonprofits, patient organizations, caregiver organizations, businesses representing biopharmaceutical device, diagnostic, and payer organizations. And we've been around over 100 years. So if you want to talk about joining membership, we'd love to have you. So please reach out to our membership team at the email below. Here you can see kind of the breadth of the patient organizations that are in our membership. Um, so thank you to those patient groups who are on the line today. So today you'll just be hearing a um, quick word from the National Health Council on some of the updates in our value classroom. Um, and then we'll turn it over to Dr. Lakdawalla to talk about the gray quality, and then we'll have some Q&A. So please come ready with your questions and feel free to share them in the chat or the Q&A function. And um, just as a note, Please keep yourself on mute during this webinar. It is being recorded. We will have it on our website afterwards. Uh, this is a forum for discussion. So we may be touching on concepts and issues that have different views among stakeholders. So please remain kind to each other. Um, and then as a note, we're excited to host this webinar for educational purposes, but the NHC does not specifically endorse any of these alternatives to the quality. And during the Q&A at the end, um, as I noted, please submit your comments during the presentation or at the end. So in 2016, the NHC launched its original value classroom with a great with a grant from PCORI. Um, that was through the Eugene Washington Award Program, and the classroom's intent was really to assist patient organizations get ready for a value assessment. We know a lot has changed in the field since then. So in 2023 and 2024, uh, we received funding to revamp this entire classroom, and we wanted to launch new tools, webinars, um, infographics on patient-centered value assessment, and how the patient voice can be included throughout the process. Uh, our amazing value work group, uh, which is made up of NHC member patient organizations, provided comments, publications, and updates to all this work. So to so those value work group members on the line, thank you so much for all your assistance. Uh, we'll be launching this updated classroom in October. So stay tuned. You'll be receiving an email from us with all this new work. Um, and I'd also like to acknowledge our sponsors for this update project. That's Genentech, Merck, and Sanofi. So thank you so much. We have two more webinars in this series, one on September 26th on the health years in total, and then one on October 2nd um, on equal value life year. So please join us for those. We'll be dropping the registration links in the chat during this webinar. So to get us started today, we're going to do a little poll question. Um, and you should be seeing it pop up on the right side of your screen. So please click open app, I think is what it says. And just let us know what type of organization are you representing today? Great, and you should be able to see it. So I see we have a lot of patient groups on the line today. That's fantastic. A lot of research nonprofits and our business and industry partners, fantastic. See a couple more people putting an answer, so I'll leave it up for another moment. Great. Well, thank you for joining us today, and thank you for participating in our little poll exercise. We'll have another poll later on in the presentation, so look out for that. Great. And I'm very excited to introduce Dr. Darius Lakdawalla. Uh, Dr. Lakdawalla is a widely published, award-winning researcher and a leading authority on health economics and health policy. He holds the Quintiles Chair in Pharmaceutical Development and Regulatory Innovation at the University of Southern California, where he sits on the faculties of the Alfred Mann School of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences and the Sol Price School of Public Policy. He's also the Director of Research 
at USC's Leonard Schaefer Center for Health Policy and Economics, one of the nation's premier health policy research centers. And his research has focused primarily on the economics of risks to health, the value and determinants of medical innovation, the economics of health insurance markets, and the industrial organization of healthcare markets. So with that, I'll stop sharing my slides and turn it over to Lakdawalla. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're really excited to hear your presentation. Thank you so much. It's really an honor to be here. Let me see if I can get my screen sharing going um, and we can get started. Can everybody see? Yes. Okay. Very good. Um, so I'm going to give a brief uh, overview of um, our, our method for value assessment called generalized risk adjusted cost effectiveness. And I'll note that GRACE, as it's called, um, is, is really an outgrowth of uh, very well established, almost ancient economic theory, but it takes concepts in economics that have been overlooked um, in uh, assessing the value to patients of new medical technology and it reincorporates them. I also promise there will be little to no math um, so that you, you don't have to be afraid of that. Let me begin with a, um, a couple of observations about what we want to achieve. And, and from an economic standpoint, Markets that are functioning well, pharmaceutical markets that are functioning well, will, will benefit patients in at least two ways. One is sort of straightforward to understand, which is that patients ought to be covered by generous prescription drug insurance. And that's because risk is bad and prescription drug insurance helps mitigate that risk. Now, I'm not suggesting that's the world we live in. I'm suggesting it's the world that we ought to live in. Those are the goals suggested by um, an analysis of the market. That's one aspect of a patient-centered and efficient market. The other side of this, which maybe is a little bit less obvious, and I'll talk about that a bit more, is that branded drug prices should reflect value to patients, meaning that uh, drugs that are more valuable to patients ought to be sold at higher prices and drugs that are less valuable to patients ought to be sold at lower prices. So I'm gonna talk about why that is and why that ultimately benefits patients. Um, to understand this, I, I want to uh, point to two different kinds of uh, effects that have been documented um, in the literature um, over, over many decades. The first is that firms all over the economy, and certainly pharmaceutical firms, respond to financial incentives. And in this particular circumstance, the issue is that pharmaceutical innovators work harder on something when their financial rewards are bigger. Um, so that's part number one. Part number two is if the rewards are bigger when patients benefit more, it then follows that pharmaceutical innovators will spend more time, money, and effort bringing to market um, innovations and technologies that benefit patients and less time on technologies that don't benefit patients. So what we want is for firms to face a landscape where they're rewarded for doing right by patients. It's actually, when you, when you think about it in those terms, it's fairly straightforward and it's how markets ought to work um, in uh, an efficient setting. Most markets that are very simple where firms are selling directly to consumers, they kind of end up working that way absent other um, frictions because businesses succeed when they make their customers happy. The problem in the pharmaceutical market is that there are many layers that pharmaceutical firms have to get through in order to reach consumers. There are insurers, there are pharmacy benefit managers, there are employers, um, there are pharmacies, there are wholesalers, there are a whole host of intermediaries, and that can adulterate the relationship between uh, the pharmaceutical firm's incentives and the needs and preferences of patients. Now, one of the implications of all this analysis, though, is that um, we need some way of understanding what's valuable to patients. And this is more complicated. Well, this probably seems complicated, and it is complicated. But there, the good news is that there are methods that are, are reasonably long established for measuring value of new goods to consumers of all kinds. And GRACE leverages those methods um, in, in uh, its goal of making value assessment more patient-centric. Before I get there though, I wanna say a few words about traditional qualities and what I'll call traditional cost effectiveness. And one empirical observation is that traditional cost effectiveness and traditional qualities 
particularly fail when we're trying to measure value to uh, patients in fairly severe health states, uh, patients who are facing severe illnesses, terminal illnesses, um, facing significant disabilities. This observation is, is not news, I'm sure, to, um, to, to most of you, if not all of you. And the criticism has been around of qualities for many decades. For instance, the National Council on Disability have, has made this point repeatedly um, that uh, qualities often um, fail to consider value to patients with or people with disabilities. Even proponents of the quality, um, for instance, ICER, routinely make exceptions to traditional cost effectiveness and value assessment in the case of very severe illness. For instance, for ultra rare disease, which is very often highly severe because ultra rare diseases typically don't have a lot of treatments, thus the un untreated disease or the standard of care um, for, the, for the disease is actually often not very good. Um, PCORI is uh, is obligated not to use qualities as part of the Affordable Care Act, which represents a, another kind of political um, viewpoint that has been manifested in, in legislation. Even um, the UK, which is one of the strongest proponents of traditional cost effectiveness, um, makes exceptions to traditional qualities and traditional cost effectiveness when it comes to cancer, which is along the same lines of a severe illness. And academics also have made the point that qualities discriminate against people with disabilities and also people who are severely ill. Um, so the question arises to why this is, what's going wrong with traditional cost effectiveness? And that was, uh, that's been a question that has really motivated me for over a decade in trying to document these problems, these empirical anomalies and trying to find a solution. I'm not alone. Um, many people have looked at alternatives to the quali, and since the Inflation Reduction Act banned the use of qualies by CMS and negotiating prices, alternatives to the quali have certainly attracted more interest, and, and a, a group of economists, including me, um, have brought attention to these various alternatives, and the three that have received the most attention are, in fact, the three that um, NHC is, is wise enough to um, begin to explore more fully in the form of these seminars. One of them is the generalized risk adjusted quality from GRACE. One of them is called equal value of life years gained. Um, and then one is called healthy years in total. Um, the research that we've been doing on this though suggests that there are some inconsistencies between equal value of life years gained um, and healthy years in total with the real preferences of patients. And I'll talk a little bit about that and, and why I think GRACE provides more flexibility to capture the preferences of real patients. But in order for us to get there, um, I wanna feel a little pull here to um, elicit uh, preferences for treatment in a, in a simple setting. And here, this is not designed to trick you, just think about the options and um, answer it as best you can. Let me present it um, so that it's a little clearer. Suppose that you're offered a choice between two different treatments that have a chance of extending your life, but each of them has a different side effect profile. So treatment A uh, gives you a 50-50 chance where 50% of the time you're going to live um, one year in perfect health, but 50% of the time, uh, or you have a 50% chance of living 10 years in extreme pain. In contrast, treatment B inverts that. There's a 50% chance of living one year in extreme pain. That is to say, I should be clear, one year is your life expectancy in all of these cases. So in treatment B, you live for one year and that year is spent in extreme pain. Um, alternatively, there's a 50% chance of living for 10 years um, in perfect health. So what I'd like you to do is think about those options and decide if you prefer treatment A, or if you prefer treatment B, or perhaps you prefer them equally. And if you prefer them equally, then um, you go ahead and choose C. So I'll give you a, a minute to think about that. Okay, so I'll wait a little bit to, for, I still see a few um, uh, answers coming in. I'll give it 
couple more seconds to finish up here. Okay, so um, I think we're all pretty much most, mostly in here. Um, so it looks like many people are choosing treatment B. Um, treatment B is a 50% chance of one year in extreme pain and a 50% chance of 10 years in perfect health. So the reason that I um, gave this example is that in, in pretty much every audience I've ever seen, a clear majority of people seem to vote for treatment B. Um, there, there are always some exceptions, but treatment B tends to be chosen um, very, very often. Interestingly, both equal value of life years and health years in total imply that um, these two treatments ought, be, ought to be equal in value. In other words, they would imply an answer of C. But grace implies the treatment B ought to be preferred. Um, and why is that? Well, grace acknowledges that Good health is more valuable when you have more time to enjoy it. Um, whereas both health years in total and equal value of life years gained conceptualize the time you have in your life as somehow distinct and independent of the quality of life that you're living. In other words, they don't really allow for the fact that better health is worth more when you have more years to enjoy it, um, whereas grace does account for it. So this is an example of how grace provides more flexibility to account for the real preferences of human patients, um, as opposed to kind of, I think, alternatives that have much more narrowly constrained um, possi possibilities for acceptable preferences. And I'll talk a little bit more about the um, foundations of this in a simple way as we move forward. But for now, file this away as an example of consistency with preferences. Um, so what's going on? Why is, why is grace, first of all, departing from traditional cost-effectiveness analysis? And what is it doing differently? One of the most important differences is that grace recognizes that health is more valuable to vulnerable people that have less of it. And that, to me, seems very intuitive, but it turns out that traditional cost-effectiveness analysis doesn't really account for that or allow for that. But in traditional cost-effectiveness analysis, there's this mantra that quality is always a quality is always a quality, meaning that context doesn't matter. Um, as long as we count up the qualities, it doesn't matter in what circumstances those qualities are being accrued. But in fact, in health, context always matters. That, for instance, patients with very bleak health circumstances may place quite a bit of value on even modest gains in their health. And economists in virtually every other application routinely agree that this is a feature of human preferences, that goods are more valuable to people that have less of them. Um, think about a, a, a simple example um, of a person living in a small 200 square foot studio apartment, an extra 100 square foot extension is, is very valuable to them. Whereas someone living in a large 10,000 square foot estate might not care so much about that extra square footage. That's a concept we, we call diminishing returns in economics. And it has traditionally been absent in cost effectiveness analysis. That's notable because diminishing returns is a force for the protection of people who have less, for vulnerable people. And as such, it also promotes equity because it recognizes there's value in giving more to the people that currently have less. So moving people closer together is intrinsically valuable. When we allow for diminishing returns to health within cost effectiveness, there are a number of new implications that arise that better match the preferences of real patients. One in particular that departs from traditional cost effectiveness analysis is that Grace says it's more valuable to increase health for, for people with disabilities, for people with severe illness, like for instance, ultra rare disease or other poorly treated conditions, um, cancer, neurological disease and the like. Um, and in that sense, context matters quite a bit. There are certainly other features of Grace um, but, uh, and I'm happy to answer questions about it as needed. Um, but I think that is a direct and particularly important difference that helps us understand why traditional cost effectiveness analysis has done so poorly 
in explaining the value of health improvement for the severely ill. It's because it sort of has like, overlooked that diminishing returns point. Grace also addresses the discriminatory aspects of traditional cost effectiveness analysis that lead to it to lead that lead to traditional qualities being banned under the Inflation Reduction Act. So let me briefly explain what I mean by discrimination here and how it works. So um, economic value is really just a multiplication problem. You know, economists love to multiply and call, call multiplication fancy things, but really it's just a multiplication between the units of health improvement that somebody receives and the value per unit of health improvement. And the reason that traditional cost effectiveness or traditional qualities discriminates is that it makes two um, assumptions which together lead to discrimination. One is that uh, people with less health in each year of their life will gain less total health when their lives are extended. Okay, so just the, um, this, this is a little bit of, of an oversimplification, but imagine that, that we could say that um, somebody has half health, you know, if, if you wanna think of it that way, in two years. Um, extending uh, that life for an additional year will produce less additional health than somebody who had full health. Okay, that's the sense in which it's meant. The second issue is that each unit of health improvement is assumed to be just as valuable to healthier groups as the sicker groups. So taken together, what happens is that life extension is viewed as less valuable um, when it's given to people that have uh, less health. And that is discriminatory. So the three alternatives to the quality address this issue in different ways. So equal value of life years gained and health years in total address this issue by essentially assuming away the um, property in number one. And, and they imagine that quality of life is actually perfect for everyone when life is extended. Um, so that does in fact eliminate discrimination because you no longer um, imagine that somebody with less health actually has less health. Um, the problem that arises is, is the one that I mentioned earlier is that uh, when you assume away this fact, um, it ends up also meaning that people don't really care about quality of life improvements. Because if you assume everyone always has the same health related quality of life, it becomes impossible to reflect the value of making your health better, like for instance, getting rid of pain, which is what we saw in the earlier example. Grace takes a different approach and it, it accepts number one as factual, largely because it reflects the preferences that people have for having higher health-related quality of life, which is why a lot of people voted for treatment option B. But it focuses on the problem in number two, and it points out that sicker people empirically derive a lot more value from health improvement than healthier ones. And if you account for that, it turns out, and I'll, I'll just talk a little bit about this in, in a few slides, um, that you can eliminate the discriminatory properties of economic analysis. So this is the only thing, only math I'm gonna show you. It's in the form of a graph. And it's just meant to demonstrate that if you collect data on the preferences of real patients, what we see is that in fact, sicker patients value health improvements more than um, healthier patients do. And the reason why is the curvature in this black curve. So the red line gives us how traditional qualities think about health, which is on the x-axis, and utility or well-being, which is a sort of a shorthand term for um, well-being and economics. And the linearity of, of the red line means that um, a given change in health produces the same amount of utility no matter how badly or well off you are in terms of your health. In contrast, the curvature of the black line tells us that if I increase health down here where I don't have a lot of it, I actually get more utility than if I increase health up here where the curve is flatter. Okay, I'm, this is um, uh, because of the slope of the curve. Um, but from a sort of a practical standpoint, when you elicit preferences from real patients, you find this pattern that uh, people believe that when uh, there, there's someone in a sicker state, that a given improvement in health is going to be more valuable. Um, and allowing for that then allows us to capture real preferences better. 
So turning back to this problem again of how we address disability discrimination, um, fundamentally the way that equal value of life years gained and health years in total solve this problem is that they assume that the value of good health is unconnected to the length of time we spend in it. And they kind of have to make that assumption because they sort of assume away differences in health um, because they want to take the view that everybody starts out with the same health. But then that leads to the problem that it's very difficult to capture the value of improvements in, in health, like elimination of pain, for instance. Um, in contrast, uh, because Grace focuses on the other aspect of discrimination of how you value improvements in health for very sick people, um, you can show that under the patient preferences that you elicit, that we've elicited in real data, that grace implies that extending life is just as valuable to people with disability as to people without disability. And that eliminates the discriminatory property that leads to the ban on traditional cost effectiveness analysis. I think correctly, that leads to the ban on traditional cost effectiveness by the Inflation Reduction Act and the Affordable Care Act. So I'll, I'll conclude here and then I'm, I'm looking forward to all of your questions. Why should you use race at all? Well, I started by saying it's important to measure value to patients um, because we need to align the incentives of innovators and make sure that they're serving the needs of patients. And that requires some way of measuring what patients value and what patients will benefit from. And GRACE gives us a very flexible and accurate way to represent patient preferences without a lot of restriction. Um, and it accounts for empirically documented patterns like the preference for treating severe illness, the preference for treating people with disabilities, and it avoids discrimination um, via that mechanism. It also offers a transparent approach. And I think this is important too. Um, and the Inflation Reduction Act is an example of this. That if we don't have something systematic that we can write down and understand and agree on, what ends up happening is that all the power rests um, in an opaque political process um, that is not accountable to anyone. And the final point is that grace is not pulled out of thin air. It's really built on very traditional, widely used and widely understood economic tools, like the concept of diminishing returns, which is something we treat every, teach every first year student in economics. And we're bringing that back to the study of valuation and health rather than blowing everything up and starting from scratch, which I don't think is um, the, uh, the, the right thing to do um, for us to move forward. So with that, I'll just note that there's been an increasing interest in grace uh, among a variety of stakeholders, including ICER, um, as an alternative to the quality that meets the non-discrimination test. But there's a lot more to be done in, for all of these alternatives to the quality. Um, in order for us to move forward and find um, the optimal way to measure value to patients. So I'll stop there and I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Lakdawalla, for this presentation. It was very health literate. I understood it <laughs> and we learned a lot. I really liked your analogy of the square footage of a house uh, to discuss diminishing returns. Um, so we do have a question in the chat, which is great. Uh, Sean asks, based on your perspective, what is the reality for broader adoption of different aspects of value that are captured by grace, given the different incentives across the inter, inter Medicaid agents in the healthcare system, like commercial payer, CMS, via the IRA, et cetera? Um, so I, I think, so it's, just to be clear, is the question about um, adoption of grace in uh, a policy setting or um, in a, a marketplace setting? I can just guess, but um, if, can, can we clarify? Sean, um, feel free to unmute yourself also if you'd like to explain. Yeah, it's kind of both because I don't think the commercial payers are going to rapidly adopt this. So I would be more interested in the policy setting. Uh -huh. You know, obviously, ICE are moving towards grace is positive. But, you know, any opinions around CMS's thoughts in this regard would be helpful as well. Yeah, sure, Sean. Thanks. So um, CMS, it is interested in grace and we've spoke, I've spoken to them several times and they were very well informed about it, which was um, I think a positive sign. I think that it's unlikely just based on how health technology assessment has worked elsewhere in the world, 
it's unlikely that CMS will adopt a um, like a, a, a very kind of formulaic mathematical approach to setting value. Um, so I think that's probably not a likely outcome. Uh, I think a likely outcome would be that CMS or a possible outcome, let me say that. I'm, I'm not in the business of predicting politics, but a possible outcome would be that um, they accept value assessment that meets the requirements of the Inflation Reduction Act as part of the value proposition for new drugs. Um, ideally, I would like to see that define a set of guardrails around what CMS is likely to negotiate. I think that will be um, something that will be debated. It will depend on what administration is in control and how much flexibility they want to give to CMS. And, and so, you know, your guess is as good as mine on that. But I, 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 my belief is that it will be viewed as an acceptable um, piece of evidence for value that will be considered in the negotiation. And I think ultimately my hope is that if things break right, it can be used as a way of setting guardrails around and, and limiting the discretion of um, CMS and setting prices that might not represent value to patients. But I think based on the, how they've been responding to grace, I think that's those are reasonable expectations in my view. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. And we're getting more questions, which is fantastic. So Ray from Faster Cures asks, can you talk a little more about how you are recording patient preferences in this model and how are you reflecting comparative quality of life? Sure. Yeah. So um, that's a great question. Um, so economists have developed a variety of techniques for eliciting patient preferences. And one of them that um, is, is uh, particularly useful in health is that you're tr you ask people to give you their uh, preferences across risky choices. So you ask them, like I, I gave you some examples of gambles in the poll. It was a very simple example. Um, but if, if I asked a, a more systematic set of questions designed to elicit your, your tolerance for risk taking, of how much are you willing to place a bet in the hope that you're going to get some big upside from a treatment that has a small chance of working? Or how much do you, are you averse to taking a chance on a treatment with uncertain health outcomes? Those kinds of questions about risk then reveal the shape of somebody's utility. And, and because we know that more risk averse people exhibit more diminishing returns mathematically. And by, on the, uh, um, in contrast, people who are risk seeking um, ex sometimes exhibit the opposite. Um, and so the idea is that you feel these kinds of, of survey uh, instruments to people to understand their preferences for risk. And then you make a mathematical inference about the shape of their utility function. These methods are used in all kinds of non-health contexts. They've also been used in health for, I think, at least about 15 or 20 years. Um, and so we're um, leveraging the literature in that uh, preference measurement uh, subfield of economics to um, look at that. Now, your question as to how we capture quality of life, it's a great question. And my hope is that um, these kinds of studies get performed in a lot of different patient settings because the dimensions of quality of life vary depending on the health circumstances people find them in, um, find themselves in, the chronic illnesses that they're facing, et cetera. So I think it's very reasonable to field these kinds of surveys to a variety of different patient groups with different survey instruments asking about different um, dimensions of health. I think that's the way we'll get the most accurate answers. For now, we fielded the survey as a first step in a general population representative group of uh, people. Um, but I believe that you'll find that preferences differ depending on the kind of kinds of patients you look at. And I think that's the next step in making sure we understand preferences instead of just assuming everybody looks a certain way, which is I think has been a mistake that's been made in the past. Thank you so much. And along the same line, Cheryl asks, can you discuss some of the issues in measuring preferences? So um, a lot of interest sure, yeah. in the patient preferences here. Yeah, um, it, it's, it's a hard problem, which is why, you know, that it's, it's always, it just, in science, these kinds of questions are always a work in progress. Um, the way that you try to mitigate these issues is that 
Um, you have to, first of all, get people comfortable with the idea of answering questions like the poll question. Can, can you make it, can you tell me what your preferences are between taking a risk and not taking a risk? So oftentimes you'll ask questions where you kind of know the answer, what the answer ought to be um, and it, it framed in a simple way and you guide people. Uh, you don't give them the answer, but you guide people through the, the answering process and then you validate their answers against what you would expect to see. And usually what you find is that, you know, typically 70 or 80% of people um, are with you. 20% um, generally aren't with you initially. Some of those people can be, um, their, their, their understanding of the question process can be improved, but there's always some fraction of people where it's just, this framing isn't easy. And it's nothing, it's no reflection on um, their talent or ability. It's just that this is a particular way of thinking that is, is not always um, obvious to people. So you wanna validate these preferences and you wanna make sure that the way you're asking the question is salient to them. So you wanna ask questions about health states that they have experienced ideally. You know, that it's, it's difficult to imagine that somebody that let's say has never experienced an illness can give you a very reliable answer about their willingness to, um, or their preferences over different treatments. So you want to connect the questions that you're asking to the experiences of patients under the view that experience provides insight into your own preferences. So I think those are the, the aspects of this. You wanna validate, make sure people are following the questioning, and then you wanna align the structure of the question with the real, health experiences of the patients that you're serving. That's such good advice, I think, for, for any of our data collection that we're doing. Um, we have three more questions, and I think we have about seven minutes, so we should get be able to get to all of them. Uh, thank you, everyone in the audience, for your interest. We really appreciate it. Um, so we have a, a question that says, great presentation. I'm curious about the data that you used for your study. I'd note that the Medical Expenditures Panel Survey is another good database to explore given the var your variables of interest. What other data might you propose would be helpful to explore going forward based on your findings? Good, okay, great question. So the data that we used for our preference measurement, we actually collected um, and we did it and, and we use something that anybody can use. And, and I wouldn't, anybody that's interested, you know, I would encourage you to look into it and I'm happy to um, provide some connections. So at USD, there's a nationally representative lo um, longitudinal panel of people called the Understanding America uh, Survey. And any researcher can go to that panel and field custom surveys to you know, X number of respondents. And you can choose the kind, if you want a subset on certain kinds of people, let's say with certain health conditions or certain ages or whatever you're interested in, you can do that. Um, and so we pushed out um, a survey designed to a subset of people and we collected the data. The, the MEPS information is useful if you're using traditional qualities um, because MEPS measures um, traditional quality of life weights using the EQ5D. And so people do use that in some circumstances. For us, that was less useful because we wanted to measure the grace quality um, as opposed to the traditional quality. Um, so for that, you need to kind of conduct um, a survey uh, of, of people with sort of risk-related questions in order to make an inference about race. Uh, but the MEPS can be useful for those people who are still using traditional cost-effectiveness analysis. And while you know I'm, I'm obviously not um, doing that and I'm not a big fan of it, it is used um, by many health economists and MEPS is useful. And it also has, has cost data along with it, which is a, a nice feature. Great. And we have a, a question. How is this sort of data collected from patients and a pediatric population? And there's no silly question. So thank you so much for asking this. Oh, yeah, that's not a silly question at all. It's actually that that's a very tricky issue. Um, the way that and in fact, a similar issue is how do you deal with this problem in a population that is um, that that is cognitively challenged? It's it's both of these kinds of populations are very challenging. The, the traditional approach is to use a proxy. You know, for a child, you use a parent as a proxy or a caregiver as a proxy. Um, and similarly for somebody with cognitive um, challenges, you do the same thing. 
it's it's reasonable to expect that the proxy doesn't perfectly accurately represent the um, values and preferences of the patient. Um, and that's a limitation. And I think it's just, I don't know that we have a better solution. I do think it's, there, there are strategies for looking at how accurate the proxy is um, in uh, a population. Because for instance, if you find that um, proxies that you, you can kind of do a validation exercise by looking at children who are previously inter who, whose proxies were previously interviewed, but then turn 18. And you kind of make an assessment about how well their proxies were doing in reporting for them. That will provide useful information about around the kinds of proxies that do a good job and the kinds of questions that elicit accurate um, answers. I think that's the best we can do is just try to validate the proxies and figure out how you get them to answer accurately. Um, there's no great solution for this um, because you, know, you can't really survey directly in those circumstances. Thank you so much. And um, I believe in a sort of similar fashion, Emma asks, are there any notable benefits of the GRACE measurement versus others regarding patient demographics, such as self um, such as self-reported gender, ethnicity, et cetera, or are most of those controlled in measurement? It's very beneficial in other areas, which you highlighted, but curious if it extends beyond. Yeah, so I think it, it there is an important advantage, which is that um, unlike, so, so equal value of life years and health years in total kind of assume a preference structure. They assume that everybody's preferences are a certain way. Grace makes no such assumptions. It just says, let's measure preferences and let's use the measured preferences. And I, what you're alluding to, I think is, is, a, is a good example that preferences may vary with demographics quite substantially. You know, like for instance, gender and sexual identity might have um, a big impact on preferences over all kinds of healthcare decisions. And, and we can, I mean, it's endless if you think about all the ways in which demography can change or demographic variables can affect preferences. So I think flexibility is crucial here and the ability to measure preferences in a customized and bespoke manner and align with the real preferences of patients is critical for making sure that patients' values are truly represented in the quantification of um, value and also in the incentives for innovation that ultimately benefit patients. Well, thank you so much. We have one more question. Um, June from the Milken Institute. For, varia for variabilities of personal preferences, do you see testing grace with large enough population for certain disease or conditions you choose and maybe come up with an appropriate uh, and maybe come up with appropriate questions for patient engagement? Yeah, so I, I think that this is this is an important area for research. And I, I think the next step right now is to begin to study whether preferences are very different for patients who are already, who are, are severely ill or who have experienced severe illness. Um, I suspect there's going to be variability. Um, I, and I, I think that that sheds light on how we ought to think about um, patient engagement in those circumstances. Because the goal here is to make sure that we understand what patients actually want and need um, because that's the only way we're going to serve those wants and needs in a marketplace. And you have to engage with patients in order to elicit that, I think. I think you can't just make assumptions about what patients' preferences are. You have to go out there and collect the data and do the shoe leather work of figuring out what preferences are. There's no perfect method. I'm not suggesting there is. But not doing anything at all is clearly worse than using the methods we have, even though imperfect, because they do show validity in important settings and they do require this kind of engagement. So there's one more question if you'd like to answer it. It's 12.45, so we can, we can stop here, um, but we do have one more if you think you have time. Um, just did you take sure. a mixed methods approach to operationalizing the GRACE model in your study? Um, if not, is that a potential next step? Um, so there is a, it is a mixed methods approach in measuring preferences in the sense that you have to do some qualitative research in order to get the survey right. It is kind of fundamentally a more quantitative approach because ultimately what you want is to quantify value. And so, you know, that, that has to be considered and quantitative approaches have limitations. 
But it's always useful to start with qualitative approaches like focus groups, um, direct structured interviews and that kind of thing in order to understand what is going to be accessible to people when you field surveys. So I would say it's mixed methods in that sense, but I mean, in fairness to mixed methods researchers, it is primarily quantitative when it comes to the collection of the data that goes into GRACE because it's an economic model. Well, thank you so, so much for joining us today. I think this gave us a lot to think about. As you can see by the questions, this is a topic that's um, really important to a lot of our different member categories and, and a lot of people in this space. So again, thank you for joining us and for this really health literate and accessible presentation. We've, we've all learned a lot. And uh, to those of you in the audience, please join us uh, for the next webinars on September 26th and October 2nd. Have a great day.